Welcome, everyone. My name is Mikey Mhenna. I'm the executive director of Afikra. Um, great to see you on this call. It is my honor to welcome our special guest, Susan Abdul Hawa, is a novelist, poet, essayist, scientist, mother, and activist. Her debut novel, Mornings in Janine, was translated in 30 languages and is considered a classic in Anglophile Palestinian literature. Its reach and sales has made Abdul Hawa the most widely read Palestinian author. Her second novel, The Blue Between Sky and Water, was likewise an international bestseller. Against the Loveless World, her latest book is out and has is already out. And she's also the author of a poetry collection, My Voice, uh, My Voice Sought the Wind, contributor to several anthologies, political commentator, and frequent speaker. Uh, Susan is the founder of Playgrounds for Palestine, which we'll talk about soon a children's organization dedicated to uplifting, uplifting Palestinian children. She's also the co-chair of Palestine Rights, the first North American Palestinian Literature Festival. And it is my honor to welcome Susan to Africa Conversations. Thank you, Mikey. It's, it's a pleasure. I'm, um, I, I love this group. Um, I didn't know about it before this, and uh, I started researching it. I, um, and hearing you, know, hearing you now talk about, talk about it, and, and particularly the core values is, um, is really wonderful and hugely needed. So um, yeah. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks. Friendly nerds save the, save the world. Okay, let's uh, talk a little <laughs> bit about um, about your work. And I want to I want to start by asking you um, a question that emerged that I started thinking about when I started researching your life, which was um, you spent the majority or the first part of your career not as a writer. Um, and that's not how you paid the bills. That's not what you did sort of during the day, all day long. Um, and so I'd love to ask you a really simple question. When did you think you were a writer? Um, good question. So, I mean, I always wrote, um, even when I was a kid, uh, I wrote Arabic poetry and love letters, you know, to, to my neighbors. Um, but I, you know, I can't, I, come from a family that um, were most, you know, most members of my family didn't go to college. We were Falahin. My parents, um, well, my dad, you know, didn't go to high school. And so we didn't have a lot of books around. And the idea of being, um, <clears throat> the, the idea of being a writer was uh, something so beyond what was attainable for me that it never even occurred to me. Um, but you know how Arab families are about being a doctor. And so I, you know, I always had something to prove and I was going to prove that I was smart and I was going to be a doctora, you know? Um, and I did, I went to medical school and, and uh, I ended up going into um, uh, research uh, as a, for uh, uh, in biology, I was a biologist and I worked for a drug company. Um, and, during the uh, second Intifada, I started just writing. It, I actually began writing just letters to the editor. Um, and then I started writing op-eds. And, and I was actually quite surprised that people were picking up, you know, editors were asking me for more. And um, Hanan Ashrawi wrote to me once after she read an essay that I had written. And... Um, it was a very brief email uh, where she said, you know, this is you know, extremely moving. Have you ever thought about writing um, a narrative, a novel and she, or, um, or a full length, you know, narrative or something like that. And uh, she just encouraged me to do that. She thought I'd be good at it. And um, I, so I kept that, you know, it was just, it, it, it had an impact on me. Um, and I had also kind of internalized Edward Said's um, lament uh, regarding, you know, the uh, the lack of Palestinian presence in Anglophile literature, uh, and you know, through a series of um, events, I uh, ended up writing Mornings in Janine. You know, I, I went to I was in Janine in the immediate aftermath of the massacre that happened there in two thousand two, and. Shortly after I lost my job um, and I had time on my hands. Um, and so I, you know, I, I wrote this narrative that um, it took a long time for it to actually get off the ground, uh, more than eight years actually. 
and uh, and it just kind of did its own thing. I mean, I was very surprised by um, you know the the success of that novel. So, and I still didn't count myself as a writer even then. You know, um, someone told me you're not a writer until you write your second novel, and so I was determined to write the second novel. <laughs> Before we get too far into, um, before we get too far into it, because I want to come back to that that sort of, uh, as you've described it, life altering decision to go to Janine in two thousand and two. Um, I want to talk a little bit about about your childhood. You were born in in Kuwait. You're, we should say uh, you you're a Palestinian. Your family is Palestinian. Uh, you were born in Kuwait, and then you went back to Palestine, and then you grew up. In, as, a, as an adolescent, as a teenager in the States. Um, on the screen, for those, uh, those of uh, you who can't see the screen, I have an image of Dar al Tifid, which is an orphanage in Jerusalem. Um, and you were there for, there, you were there for a few years. Um, and that undoubtedly has impacted your perspective. I'd love to hear a little bit about those years, what you remember of those years and how, um, how that may have impacted sort of the stories in you? Um, those were really formidable years for me. Um, I was at Dar al for three years. Um, my, actually my, my mom, my aunts had been at Dar al as well before me. And um, because they, they lost their father um, and, before the war, before everybody um, was kicked out. And so and my grandmother had nowhere to, to take them. Sorry about that. That's the neighbors doing some banging. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it, it was my, God, sorry. It was, it really um, helped forge a connection to the land actually, um, to Palestine. Um, yeah. Can you guys hear that? Is it really yeah, loud? Yeah, it's for okay. You? Don't worry. This is a okay. this is the world we live in. If it's not okay. neighbors, it's kids. If it's not kids, it's <laughs> it sounds really loud to me. But I hope it's not for, to you. Um, yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, you know, at the time, it was just you, you know the milieu that we were in. The the life under occupation was was kind of normal. It just, it, it was what it was. Um, the soldiers and the harassment and the racism. <clears throat> uh, it, but it was only, you know, as an adult reflecting on these things that uh, you start to try and unravel them and make sense of these things. And uh, <clears throat> I, um, there's a whole chapter in Mornings in Janine <clears throat> that uh, it's called The Orphanage. And I put the main character, um, Amal, in my life at the orphanage. So most of the things that you read in that, uh, in that chapter are uh, autobiographical and quite real. Yeah, um, I, was, I, was amazed, uh, I was amazed by that because you know, it seems that you've made a conscious choice to, to write fiction. Um, you, could, you could easily write uh, autobiographical, more, more sort of um, tightly, tightly knit, autobiographical stuff, um, they're not, uh, that's not obviously beyond you, um, but there's that choice. Okay, I'm, you know, this chapter is gonna be a little more autobiographical. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the characters that sort of emerge across your, across your works. Um, I've heard you say this phrase a lot that your loyalty is to the characters um, and that you're, you're not thinking about the audience, you're not thinking about the editors, you're not thinking about um, the, the buyers, whoever, or the media, you're really thinking about these, these characters and telling their stories. Um, I wonder, for, for Mornings and Janine, if you can uh, go back to what you were saying earlier, where did these characters come from? So in 2002, you, you make this decision um, to go to Janine, um, if you could share um, a little bit about a little bit on the context as to why then um, for the for the people who don't know what was happening at the time um, and then who are these characters who show up in this book 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, um, when I do write, I mean, I do, I am kind of a one track mind and that's just, um, a loyalty to the characters and, and, and that's, you know, I mean, every writer has their own process. And, and for me, that's just, that's just what works for me. And I, I think that's the only way to really tell a story with honesty and authenticity. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, and, and, and having a loyalty to the characters too, and just sort of writing for the characters. I think by default, because all my characters are Palestinian, by default, that means that I'm writing for a Palestinian audience. Um, even though I'm not really, I don't have the audience in mind, but um, the characters emerge um, kind of organically. I don't really have a good sense of who they are before I start writing. Um, I, I start with a few seeds um, that, I, that I want to be in the book. For example, Mornings and Janine, I knew that I wanted to incorporate the experience of Janine. And I knew that I wanted to um, uh, explore the dynamic of, that was first articulated by Hassan Kanafani um, regarding this, this notion of a Palestinian child growing up as an Israeli Jew. Um, so those are really the only two things that I knew starting um, going into Morning Sinjin. Oh, and also that the brothers would kind of meet each other after the war. Um, with uh, um, the blue between sky and water, likewise, I knew I wanted it to take place in Gaza. I wanted um, I wanted the. Uh, <coughs> there to be sort of a, a diasporic experience in the United States. And with the blue between sky, I mean, the uh, against the loveless world, I the seeds that I started with were um, Kuwait uh, and that whole experience of that large portion of our diaspora that, um, that lived in Kuwait and then was subsequently uh, exiled um, out from Kuwait. And then, um, and I wanted it to involve sex work um and political prism <laughs> so i i really do just start with these overarching ideas and i just and in the initial drafts are really crap i mean they really are just crap i would just be embarrassed for anybody to read them but um they you know through the process do you, of do you do you take specific scenes or do you start with sort of an overarching story or how do you draft so it's mostly stream of consciousness um yeah. And the best way I can liken it, the, the, the best analogy is to a sculptor who starts with a big clump of clay, right? And it's nothing. It's just you mold it sort of in the general shape. And that's kind of what I do. Like I just write, um, I write characters as they come into my mind. I write scenes and, and I just keep going until I have about like three or 400 pages and to me, I know it sounds silly, but to me just having that physical printout of 400 pages yeah. Um, it, you know, is psychologically important in my process. And, and then I just, and then I rewrite and rewrite. And at some point when I feel like I'm having feelings about the characters, I, I think I'm on the right track. Uh, yeah. And then there's just a lot of rewriting. Um, I, I would imagine that your work as like, a, as a, a biologist and a researcher and a, and a scientific writer, you hone the skill of editing and you hone the skill of precise, you know, precision. Um, and I would imagine that that weirdly comes into, into um, utility, it becomes useful. It's, it's weird, because I, you know, at one point I was, after I left research, I left the lab, um, I started, I worked as a medical writer. Mm -hmm. And that type of writing is actually completely different. I start with an outline, like I, everything is outlined, I know exactly, because it's very structured writing. Um, it's, there's not a whole lot of creativity that goes into it. And um, so yeah, no, it's actually just a total different part of my brain that functions with that kind of writing, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, before we move on to um, some, some of the other books to sort of zoom into, I was curious about um, how, you know, the sort of intervening years between 2002, when you were one of the first uh, quote unquote international observers to um, after the aftermath of the massacre in Janine to 2010. Um, 
there is this uh, in 2006. Can you tell me the story or shed light on this yeah. idea of the scar of David and Maureen Janine and how those are related and um, yeah. what that evolution is? So, um, it, so, I, so I wrote Mornings and Janine, which was called, called The Scar of David initially, and I couldn't get a publisher. Uh, finally found this small publishing house that, um, uh, you know, agreed to publish it, but they, you know, unbeknownst to me, they were going out of business. Um, and, uh, it was basically dead on arrival when it was printed. It was never, it got, it got no distribution. And, but in the meantime, uh, a French publisher had read it and was interested in publishing it. And likewise, an Italian publisher and through, and it did in the book did quite well in both places. The French title was Mornings in Janine, which I really loved when I when I saw that. And yeah. it was through it was through my French publisher that I um, got my first agent, who then sold it to Bloomsbury, and then you know, it's the same story, but the Scar of David is not told in chronological order, which to be honest, I kind of preferred to be on, um, but. Uh, one of the th things that Bloomsbury asked me to do, required me to do rather, um, was to, you know, to make it more linear. So I did have to do that. And I ended up adding like a couple of small connecting chapters or connecting paragraphs just to make it flow a bit more smoothly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the same story. Just, just, there are some slight differences though. Yeah. Um, it's a, it is a, um, there's a message in there for struggling, <laughs> struggling novelists <laughs> worth, uh, um, worth mentioning. So during, during that time, were you, after 2010, um, were you surprised by the critical acclaim? Kinda, yeah. I mean, I was delighted by it. Yeah. And I think, well, you say critical acclaim, um, or the it acclaim. was, the truth is, in the literary community, I mean, and all my, my books are mostly, have mostly been ignored by the literary community until recently, until this new one. Um, Mornings in Janine kind of became what it did despite uh, the lack of acclaim. Um, from, from, yeah, there wasn't, there, I mean, I couldn't get it reviewed in the United States. There's only one one review uh, and it was it was the, Philadelphia Inquirer, and that's because I knew the editor. <laughs> um, and likewise, the you know the blue between sky and water, and the uh, um, the against a loveless world. I actually changed publishers in the United States. Bloomsbury is still my publisher in the UK, but in the US, um, I uh, it's being published through Simon and Schuster Atria Books, and uh, I have this really wonderful team of women who have really sort of, you know, pushed it and tried to get it out there. And so it's gotten, um, it's gotten a little bit more uh, play in mainstream media than my other two books. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I feel like it's, um, it seems like not that long ago, but the, the, the level of sort of anti-Arab and Arab American sentiment um, post 9-11, even going up to 2010, it was so intense. It's, it's almost, it's easy to forget the intensity yeah. of it. Um, I was telling, I moved to the States in 2003 and I, I was talking to somebody about the wow. intensity of that sentiment then, com even compared to now, I feel like it's a very different, very different time. I don't know if that resonates with you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, um, I had a Free Palestine bumper sticker on my car and after 9-11 and uh, my car got keyed, you know, just yeah. I had hate mail on my, on my car. It's so, you know, it was just a lot of things, it, even like people who knew me, neighbors just, you know, stopped talking to me. It's one of the reasons, you know, I got fired from my job at the time, um, you know, because I, I had been writing a lot of um, anti Israel, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, pro-Palestinian op-eds and 
Uh, and I think, you know, the things that I had been writing in light, uh, you know, had already angered people, but after 9-11, it was okay for people to be openly hostile and express their feelings um, in more material ways. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about how you, um, how you may or may not feel like you're switching hats um, when you, when you uh, approach a project as an author um, versus as an activist. Um, do you feel like you're switching hats or are you like, these are, I'm the same person going into this project. I don't feel like, um, in both, in both situations, I am searching for the truth and, and in defense of the truth. Um, or does it feel like there are different parts of your brain or different parts of your heart or different parts of you, period? No, I think it's, you know, th there are no hard boundaries. Um, it's kind of like trying to separate uh, being a woman, a woman from being a mother, um, from, you know, it's, it's all continuous and it's, um, everything sort of reinforces, you know, it's, it's all contained within a single person. And even though, for example, I said that, you know, my medical writing is a different part of my brain. There is, there is, you know, some separation, at least in my mind and in the writing, but, you know, I'm certain they, they inform each other in many ways. Yeah. Um, I also, so this idea that, you know, art and politics and activism, that they would be separate is kind of, I think it comes from this notion is, which is a very Western notion that um, art is, sh is and should be separate from the grit of life. It should be separate from the politics, from, uh, and, and I, I just don't have that worldview. I think, um, I think maybe coming from a, a society of struggle where, you know, politics is determined, is, is, it has determined your, your life, has determined the trajectory of your destiny. Um, is uh, it, it, it makes art and, and politics intertwined and utterly inseparable. Um, whereas I think when, you know, if you come from a society of privilege, it's very easy to say, oh, I don't get involved in politics. You know, I just do my art. So it can be separate for people like that, whose lives, um, whose immediate lives, I guess, are not uh, at least, you know, in their imagination are not shaped by the politics of the day. Yeah, yeah. Your, your, your privilege is political, so you don't have to be. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk a little bit about the subject matter in uh, Against the Loveless World. Um, I feel like uh, when, uh, when, at least when I think about sort of um, uh, stories about, uh, or maybe I should say this, or when I think about Palestinian stories, um, I don't immediately think about stories set in Kuwait, and I don't think about um, women who are being forced into, uh, for one reason or another, into um, the sex trade, essentially. Um, but it's clearly a part of many different contexts. Um, and you know, what, what motivated you to shed light on that, to explore it yourself um, in, 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 a, in, in the form of a actually deep dive into a project? What was the motivation behind that? So I think, you know, um, Palestinians tend to be, um, we tend to exist in such a dichotomy in, in popular imagination, even, even in Arab imagination. You know, we are either these, you know, supervillains who are just irrational, crazy, just inherently violent, or what, you know, just people to fear, to, to, to repudiate, or we are these mythical, romanticized creature, creatures, you know, under the banner, who live under the banner of Sumud, who can endure anything, who are also, who are pitiable refugees and, and in need of help and rescue. And, um, and, and, you know, sometimes I think even um, our society in the same way, you know, when you have popular images, your children internalize those own images about themselves. And we even internalize images that 
come from outside about ourselves. Um, and that that's true even in the Arab world where, where other Arabs, you know, know and understand us a little better. They still sort of sometimes think of us in those ways. Yeah. Um, you know, and of course, you know, we are a society like every society. We, you know, we span the full spectrum of humanity, the full spectrum of goodness and, and evil. And, um, and, uh, and I, I'm really, I'm interested in people who are, who are broken, who, I mean, we're all broken in one way or another, but people who, who are forced to, forced on the margins of life in, in some way. Um, First, you know, and, and for us, a society that's already forced to the margins, you know, to look at the people that we forced to the margins of our marginalized society. Uh, and that, and those are, uh, you know, people in the sex trade, I, I thought that would, um, uh, that would capture, you know, that, that element. Um, and I wanted to take a person like that, um, explore her life explore her humanity, her inner world. And I, and I wanted to put her in one of the most exalted positions in our society. And that is one of, you know, a freedom fighter. And then in doing that to just kind of explore all the contradictions, the nuances, the, you know, whatever came up in the writing, whatever came up in her life and, um, and find out, you know, her, the evolution of her life, how she gets from, being a very kind of um, average, shallow young woman uh, who lives in Kuwait and, and really is just uh, has very small aspirations to, um, you know, just to be married and have fancy appliances. Um, I, I love the, I love the fancy appliances mention. <laughs> <laughs> that tickled me the first time. Um, so, um, we're already 35 minutes into this. I really want to talk about um, Playgrounds a little bit because there's going to be lots of questions about the book. Um, I'd love to um, for you to just describe to everyone the what the sort of um, impetus uh, or the conceit of Playgrounds for Peace and, um, you know. Palestine. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> Playgrounds for Palestine, I'm staring at it. I don't even have to remember, I could read it. Uh, Playgrounds for Palestine and um, your role in your role in the organization now. Um, so Playgrounds for Palestine started uh, as an idea in the in, in 2000. Uh, it was the first year I'd gone back after being away from Palestine, um, you know, for almost 17 years. And my daughter at the time was three years old, and playgrounds in the U.S. were such a big part of our lives. And it was, you know, the absence of playgrounds was so conspicuous to me, um, especially, you know, looking at a lot of, a lot of just empty lots that were filled with trash and um, rocks and rubble. Uh, so I, you know, I, I thought uh, maybe this was something I could do. Maybe I could figure out a way to just get playgrounds here. And uh, like everything else that I do, I don't really, <laughs> I just kind of dive into it and I don't really think about it, which is, um, you know, sometimes it works out, <laughs> usually it doesn't, but in this case it did. Um, I, uh, got some friends together. I filed the, you know, whatever paperwork for, for to get a 501c3. As a matter of fact, at the time I was, you know, I was kind of living paycheck to paycheck. I was a single mother and I had to borrow the $500 for the filing fee, um, and whatnot. Uh, and then, you know, we managed to get our first playground donated. Uh, we um, got it shipped there. Uh, Anira helped us clear it. We built it at the, it's actually that bottom one there in the photo that you have. It's on the grounds of the Lutheran um, church at El Kalima, which is sort of an educational institution in, in Bethlehem. And yeah, and after that, I mean, we just, uh, we're, we're a group of, committed Palestinians um, and, and, uh, and friends. We were all volunteers. Uh, we've never, we never went beyond that. We didn't really want to. We wanted to kind of remain that way with really low overhead. We raised money throughout the year, mostly selling olive oil. We used to have uh, an annual banquet, um, which we haven't had 
because of the pandemic in the past two years. Um, yeah, and then whatever we get, you know, whatever we manage to raise, we we use it towards building playgrounds. And we also, we've been sponsoring like more children's activities too, like summer camps. Uh, we built, you know, a, um, a skate uh, a skate park. Um, yeah, skate pal, with Skate Pal. With, yeah, Skate Kelia. Oh, yeah, these are the guys who also yeah. use the stuff in Jordan as yeah, well. Yeah, they also do, they, they work with Skate Pal too. Yeah. And yeah, so they have a, they have this wonderful skate camp every summer and we, yeah. we, we fund that every, every summer. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not changing the world, but it does, I mean, it makes a big difference in, in young lives to have, you know, a place, a refuge, a place that's colorful to go and just, yeah. just be. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's very, very moving. Um, I want to talk a little bit uh, before we move on to um, what is your process now? What are you working on right now? Are you constantly reading other writers? Do you feel like you're in conversation, at least internally, with other projects um, that are coming out now or that are historical and you're responding to Latin American uh, fiction? Or, you know, um, yeah, what are you working on now? What are you reading? Um, honestly, the past, it's been really hard for me to write the past, um, almost two years. It's just, I, partly the pandemic, partly, you know, I've been kind of moving and between homes and I'm settled. So I haven't really been writing much, honestly. I, I do have, um, a story that I'm writing in my head and I, I think about it off and on. Uh, and I will at some point sit down and start committing it to paper. Uh, I am reading, uh, I usually, am, I'm usually reading several books at once. I, I just finished a few um, fiction books that were on the uh, Aspen, um, Aspen Words uh, finalist list. But I'm also reading um, a few books on um, <clears throat> George Habash. Um, I, I went to, I was trying to find a definitive biography on him and I was really kind of dismayed and shocked that there really, there aren't any, I mean, there are a few books on him in, in Arabic, uh, but none that are like full length biographies and there's nothing in English really to speak of. So, um, Honestly, I'm just I'm I'm just reading what I can get my hands on now to see if uh, if there's a way to um, produce a a biography on him in English, whether I do it or I find someone else to do it. But I but in doing that, I also realize that there's a lot of our the people that we uh, our own you know literary and and revolutionary heroes don't have much of a presence in um, in English literature. You know, like uh, um, there's not a lot on like there's nothing on Maziade, for example, um, Abdul Qadir Hosseini. You know, uh, George Habash, of course. Um, the, you know, I mean, thankfully, you you know some but not enough has been written about Edward Said but there's we don't have enough of that so that's kind of that's another project in my that's kind of bubbling in my head cool. more out of necessity than you know creativity but <laughs> yeah the, the amazing idea uh, I've thought about that a bunch um Okay, we kind of uh, accidentally got into the quick Q&A. We're gonna go through these and then open it up to the chat. Um, and I should mention, you just mentioned the Aspen Rights Award, um, which uh, you just told me, which is very exciting. Um, your latest book is nominated as a finalist and hopefully um, we find out good news about that soon. Okay, um, the second question is, who would you love to shadow for a day past or present? You know, there's just a lot of people. <laughs> That's a really hard one. Um, there, there's just so many. I mean, there's a lot of people I admire. Uh, I mean, on my wall in my office, I have I have photos 
I'll tell you the people that are, you know, on my office. Um, there's Malcolm X, Harriet Tubman, Edward Said, um, uh, Che Guevara, <laughs> uh, Sylvia Pankhurst. I mean, all of these people I, I admire and Rasan Kanafani um, in different ways for different reasons. Um, yeah. I have to say, you know, I've always lamented that uh, we lost Edward Said um, before, you know, before he could see this explosion of Palestinian literature. I mean, there's just in, in English I and mean, there's so many young writers and um, it would have been nice to to have his, you know, his reaction to, to my, I would have loved to have his reaction to, to my books. Yeah, he would have enjoyed Palestine rights. He would have, he, well, he was, you know, he was there in spirit, you know, we had him, we had his picture um, yeah. and his memory there, but. Absolutely. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Um, that it's written for a Western audience. It's not. Is it written for anybody? Any no. audience? No. And I touched on that before. You know, yeah. I write for the characters, which by default means that I'm writing for a Palestinian audience. But again, I'm not, that's not in my head when I'm writing. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, you know, because I write in English, uh, you know, that's that English speakers are. are but um, I, yeah, I, I'm not writing for anybody. Who's, uh, you already mentioned a few names, but whose work do you admire or are inspired by? Maybe um, other novelists. I'm sure there's a long list, especially almost everybody, if everybody you invite to Palace on Rights, but are there any names that in particular you think people should check out um, as people you are inspired by? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm always, I always, when I read fiction, um, I think you're inspired by really every book that you like. I mean, it kind of, you know, you internalize a little bit of every book that, that you love. Um, there's one book that I, that I read multiple times that I really love, and it's 100 Years of Solitude uh, by Marquez. That is one of my favorite novels. Uh, but there, there's so many others, you know, the, like I said, you know, I didn't come from a, um, a an intellectual family and, and certainly not a family that had books around either. Um, and on top of that, you know, when I came to the United States, I couldn't, I, I was barely literate. I could read maybe on a first or second grade level. So I had this, you know, I was this 13 year old who could barely read and I had this big secret and I had to really hustle to teach myself. Um, because I was so ashamed. Uh, and I finally, by the end of that year, was able to read um, a book cover to cover. The first one was this, you know, sort of a, a young adult novel it was called The Outsiders. But the other one um, was The Color Purple. And I think, you know, that that has had an uh, those, those are literally the first two books you read. Those are pretty, <laughs> those are pretty good books, to, and number one and number two. <laughs> yeah, basically. And at, at the age of like 14, too, um, just, uh, you know, it was embarrassing at the time. But the color purple, uh, you know, has a special place in my heart because of that. Um, and it has impacted me. Um, you know, you can kind of look back and see the, all the ways that literature has has affected you. And that uh, and that's certainly one of them. Yeah, and it's really such like such an honor now to to know Alice Walker personally and and uh, and call her friend. So that that's kind of been um, one of those Pretty circle, incredible. beautiful things in life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you you are somebody's Alice Walker. I'm sure. Um, so let's have uh, Wissam. I think we're going to start off with you. I just wanted to ask. You said that uh, there weren't much. Um, uh, writers who write in English. Uh, in the beginning, you said um, building on what Edward Said uh, mentioned. I just want to ask if you had any difficulty getting published. I'm sure you had a lot, but if you can share some stories about the difficulties you faced uh, being writing, you know, writing about Palestine or being an Arab writer. Oh, absolutely. Even um, even now, believe it or not, and it's really mostly just in the United States. 
So for this new novel, um, Against the Loveless World, I, I had a new agent. And when I, you know, when I went to her, um, she, she thought this, you know, she loved the book. Um, and she also thought that it would be such an easy sell because I had, um, in her words, such a large platform. And because Mornings and Janine had already, you know, proven itself um, internationally. And I, you know, I, I said her, I told her, I said, Anjali, you know, don't be so quick. You, you, I, you know, I'm your first Palestinian <laughs> um, client. So, and it was, and it was a shock to her to realize how many, uh, how hard it was to sell a, a Palestinian novel that she loved, that she felt was really good and by an author, by an established author. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not, I don't, it's not easy. Uh, not just it's not simply just being a Palestinian author it's the subject matter I think there are actually a lot of publishers who like to say you know we published a Palestinian author but it's like what are they writing um and I think I think for most publishers the stuff that I write kind of um crosses crosses lines that um some of them aren't ready to cross Super particular lines regarding, um, you know, just really uh, telling the truth about, about Israel, you know, and um, yeah, and not not being not being the not being the good Arab, or the good Palestinian, I guess, um, or whatever mold that they need you to be in to, uh, um, yeah. To be to be to be an author for them. Okay, thanks. Um, I, our previous question that I skipped by mistake was from Rayel, who's no longer on the call, but she asked, "Did the film Janine uh, by Mohammed Bakri have an influence, one way or another, on your writing?" Um, so Janine, Janine came out. Um, I can't remember what year it came out, uh, but I was I had already written. Um, I'd already written Mornings in Janine, I think. Yeah. Uh, it certainly impacted me as a person. Um, and because I, you know, I was there. And actually, I see in, in the messages, um, someone sent me a direct message. How did you become an observer in Janine uh, to the Janine massacre? Can you explain the process? Whatever. Um, and if I was uh, an official, I was not an official observer. I went there completely on my own. Um, I just, uh, and again, this is go, goes back to, you know, not planning anything. I really just, I felt like I needed to be there. I was working at a drug company at the time. My daughter was young. Um, I, I let her, I took my two weeks vacation, took my daughter to her dad's and I just went there. I had no idea how I was going to get to Janine. Um, but you know, it's really, it's easy, um, to, to, to find a place to stay and, and a welcoming family in Palestine. And that's basically what I ended up doing. I, I got you know somebody to take me to Janine. I found a wonderful family who, who took me in um, and helped me get into the camp. Actually, we got in the day before it was officially open. So we snuck in. Um, and at the same time, so before I, I went to Janine, I'd actually been at the Mokata and the, and the ISM was trying to get in. Um, there was, uh, there was some, some folks who were injured and some folks who needed medicine inside and they were running out of food. Uh, and ISM had created this process where they had one group be a decoy and another group kind of go in to, to the Mokata to take supplies in. And I had been part of the, the decoy group um, and I, I have footage of that. It was actually um, uh, Fox News of all places actually covered that. You know, we were being, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'd be shot at and these soldiers sort of threw me to the ground and my camera tumbled. And, um, but I, I was able, I managed to get out of that. And then um, that was where I met someone who, who took me to Janine. Um, and it was extraordinary. I mean, I, you know, being Palestinian, you kind of grow up, you know, about the Sabra and Shatila massacres, you see the images and, and you have this in your consciousness, but it was an entirely different experience to, um, to smell it, um, to, to be, to see, to be up close with the kind of 
the despair and the resilience and the resignation and the defiance and all of these, all of these incredible hot emotions um, in, in, in one place and such a, such a, 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 a visually horrific and gray existence after after what was done i mean there were so many stories and um i could just kind of fill the whole hour with you know what you know what we observed and what i saw there but suffice it to say it really it reor it reoriented me it reoriented me spiritually professionally um intellectually um it changed my life um so and and it was you know, I, I felt this sort of determination to, to, to tell this story in one way or another. And that's, that was really the genesis of Mornings and Janine. As a, as, a, as a means to tell it to yourself, were you, in the moment, did you realize your life had changed or at that moment you were just- um, No, no, I think it's, you know, in the moment you are, I mean, there, you know, you're just kind of going, you just, taking it all in there's no processing at all i mean we were the, i never saw the red cross there i mean i was there for um two weeks a week and a half rather never saw the red cross the only official um well actually that's not true they did come through with some observers but they weren't helping with anything the red crescent um was there they were volunteers and we were helping them dig bodies out there was a norwegian team that was that came with special equipment to try and um to use to, to try and detect life under the rubble because a lot of people were buried in their homes. Um, and those were the only official people that I, that I saw in my entire time there. Otherwise, it was just people in the camp and some Red Crescent volunteers who were literally just trying to piece life back together. And at one point, there was a U.S. People didn't have water. I mean, and most people were just staying in. There was a, there was a Y. And then there was also a school where people were just sort of camping out. And at one point, um, there was a U.S. aid truck full of water uh, that was bringing water and tents to the camp. And the men in the camp, all the Shabab, um, just kind of linked arms and, you know, were like, we don't want your water, you know, just go to hell. Um, and they blocked, they blocked the water from coming in. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, there were so many, I mean, I mean, I could go on about the stories there, but uh, yeah, and, and even just, you know, reflecting on it now, it's still, it still feels impactful. Um, and I was just an observer, you know, I didn't live it. I just witnessed it. I just, I, I, I yeah. Um, thanks for sharing that. Um, Lindsay's question. Lindsay said, um, It'd be great for you to reflect on the development of your style. Loveless World is more experimental, i.e. formally ambitious than Mornings and Janine. Is that intentional? Do you notice that yourself or do you think she's off the mark? Um, I don't really know what that means. I do think that I, that I um, as a writer, I think I developed um, uh, with each novel. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I don't really... <laughs> I don't have an MFA and I'm not versed in literary lingo, so to speak. I don't know what's experimental and what's not experimental. I hear that word a lot. And, um, and to me, I'm just kind of writing a story. Um, and it's interesting to me to, to hear people, you know, um, this isn't the first time someone said it was experimental. Um, so that's cool, <laughs> but I don't really know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so great. That makes me that makes me so happy. Okay, let's do um, Fadi's question. Fadi, I'm going to ask you to unmute one second. Yes, hello. Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, talk. I have a question that I always wonder uh, about. It's um, how big is the impact that your writing has on the public awareness of uh, Palestinian cause? And does it go beyond like preaching to the converted? And uh, the other question is that, is that the main incentive behind your writing? Um, I'm gonna start with the last question. It is not the main incentive. Um, I, you know, I think um, if you guys will walk with me, I'm gonna just let my dog out, she's harassing me. Um, it is not, 
uh, my main incentive. I do, you know, I care about Palestinian literature. I care about Palestinian art. Um, I think like every society, we have a, we have a right and um, to, to have a place in literature. We have this extraordinary, beautiful culture that, that precedes um, Israel, that precedes our problems by thousands of years. And, um, and as an ancient society, you know, we, we have um, cultural workers, we have art, we have, uh, we have so much to tell, so much, um, so much to talk about and so much to create, not for the rest of the world to see our humanity, but for ourselves, for our children, for our ancestors. Um, we, you know, we don't exist uh, because of our proximity or because of our proximity to, uh, to a, a geopolitical issue. Um, we, are, we are so much more, we are so much bigger, we are so much more important, we are so much more relevant um, because of who we are as a nation, as an ancient society. So, um, so it, that is, that's not my motivation in writing. Um, but I do, but I, but I write, I write, you know, I say that and I know it's ironic because I write from, from this, this trauma, from, from this political trauma that we've all experienced. Um, but that's because, you know, that is what, what stirs me the most. And that is what stirs our society. Um, because it is such an unredeemed history. It is, it is, is, it is an unacknowledged, unredeemed, um, part of us. And, uh, and it's this, and it's also this massive wound where that's common ground to all of us, no matter where we are, what part of what part of our society we we come from, um, and it's it's the common place where we can all meet and exist together, and so that's why I write from that from that particular trauma. As far as whether it has had um, an impact or not, um, I I have to say, I mean, I've I gotten you know thousands of letters over the years from people all over the world telling me that you know they they never um they never imagined our society um in the way that I present it in in the novels they never understood what was going on um so there was even this woman in Sweden this is this is probably the most um, extraordinary reaction. There's a woman in Sweden who um, read my novel and decided to um, sell her house and just go uh, work for Palestine. <laughs> and she went to Palestine. It was kind of a, a, a pretty amazing story. But you know, I mean, you can see the re you can see um, reader reviews that sort of talk about the effect of um, uh, the effect that novels have had on their perception of Palestine and Israel. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's the power of, of literature uh, everywhere. You know, that's the power of novels. It's power of fiction, um, regardless of whether it's about Palestine or not. Great. That's about the best Amazon review possible. Um, change my life, move somewhere new. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much, Susan. This was a, a thrill for me. It was really a pleasure to be able to talk to you. And I'm glad that your your dogs was a, were able to make a cameo. Yeah. Well, here's here's Luca. He's just trying to say hi. Hi, Luca. <laughs> um, it was so great to see so many questions in the chat. Thank you to all of you who typed that stuff in. Um, and just so everyone knows, we have another call on Thursday with another author, Mustafa Bayoumi. Um, and so. Be sure to check that out. And we have published events from now until June 17th. So go to our website, check out what's coming up uh, and be a part of the conversation. Susan, thank you so much. This will be on our podcast and on the YouTube page next week. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Bye. Bye everyone. Have a good day or night, wherever you are.